Hello everyone, and welcome to our latest State of .NET webinar, our .NET 6 preview. Today, Marcus Eger will provide guidance on what to expect in .NET 6 and what we might see at .NET Conf November 9th through 11th. Save the date at the .NET Conf website, .NET Conf .NET. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm the Director of Business Development here at Code. I'm responsible for the marketing and sales efforts for all of our code services, including Code Magazine, of course, but code is so much more than just a magazine. Our continuing mission is to help people build better software. We're a Microsoft partner and provide a number of services, including building custom software applications on-prem and in the cloud, modernizing legacy applications, educating developers, providing developer resources to augment your development team, and supporting and maintaining existing applications. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help you with your project. One of the very popular services we offer, we call our free hour of code. It provides an opportunity for you and or your team to meet with our hand-picked experts to discuss anything you need our help with. Slots are limited, so reach out to me today about getting a free hour of code scheduled for you and your team. There's no strings, there's no commitment, no credit card required, just free help from our code experts. Code Consulting is hiring React developers. Come join the Code Consulting team. We have multiple junior and senior React positions open, both remote and on-site. Full-time and contractor positions are available. Follow the link for more information. Looking for a new gig? Check out our jobs page for our open positions. Are you interested in writing for Code Magazine? Follow the link for more information. Are you looking to add team members to your development team? We can help there too. Our staffing division can help you find the development talent you're looking for. If you like what you see today or have seen in our prior webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Code Magazine is the leading software development magazine written by expert developers for developers. As a benefit for attending today, all registered attendees who don't already subscribe will automatically receive a free digital Code Magazine subscription. I've also included a free subscription link here for you to freely share with others who couldn't make it to the webinar. We would like your feedback on this webinar in the form of a very quick survey, and we're willing to pay $100 in the form of an Amazon e-card to one lucky attendee. A name will be drawn from the entire webinar's registered attendee list, and a completed survey is required to qualify for the e-card. If the selected name hasn't completed a survey, well, then another name is selected, and so on. No one wants to be that person whose name is selected only to lose out because you hadn't completed the survey, right? The survey is very short, and you'll finish it in no time flat. The survey link is on the slide, and we'll post the survey link in the chat window as well. Just a quick shout out here about Fotino. Fotino is an open source project the code team is involved with that allows .NET devs to create native cross-platform desktop applications using web development technology. You can leverage your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript skills to create desktop applications that run on Windows, Linux, and the Mac. It's like Electron, only smaller and much lighter. Learn more at tryfotino.io. The slides and recording of today's webinar, and all of our webinars, will be available on the stateof.net page on the code website. I've included that link here. Our presenter today is Marcus Egger. Marcus is the big shot around here. He's code president and chief software architect, publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft regional director, and all around nice guy. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. If you've attended one of our webinars in the past, welcome back. Okay, you've heard enough from me. Thanks. Take it away, Marcus. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Uh, great to be doing another State of .NET. This is a little bit of an unusual installment. This time we're doing something that we're doing for the very first time. And that is, I'm actually, as they say, recording this live to date, unfortunately, uh, to tape. Unfortunately, we had a little bit of a scheduling conflict, uh, so I can't do this live for the first time. We're recording it. Um, however, my people are still online live as you see this. Uh, if you're attending the quote unquote live event, we're still there to answer your questions. Maybe if everything goes right, I'll be even able to log in myself as this airs and answer questions in the chat window. So, Little bit of an experiment. Uh, I'm in our headquarters in Houston, Code HQ, 
Uh, great to be back in the office. It's kind of another attempt to go back into an office environment very carefully after we did that about a half a year ago and then had some pandemic-related setbacks. Um, so a lot of fun to be here in Houston again, a little bit jet-lagged. Um, so if I look tired, that's because I am, but excited to be here nonetheless. So what are we going to talk about? Actually, this is a very, very cool presentation today. I've been looking forward to this because it does feel like we are finally almost there. Uh, we're talking about .NET 6, and .NET 6, of course, brings us full circle with the vision that has started in some ways with .NET Core 1.0, but then really after .NET Core 3.1. Uh, so bringing all the different .NET flavors back under one umbrella, uh, stop a fragmentation of the platform, and that's what .NET 6 is in short. Uh, so there's some very, very important news some of them may not be important to you in terms of day-to-day -day what you do, but they're certainly important day-to-day -day in terms of how .NET runs and operates. Um, we're also going to talk about Visual Studio 2022, kind of a cool new feature, new, new release of Visual Studio. I'll show you some features out of that. We'll briefly talk about Visual Studio Code. There's some exciting news there as well. We'll talk about the languages that go uh, with .NET 6 because languages, in particular C Sharp, are now in lockstep with the .NET release version. Uh, we'll have to, of course, talk about web development. That's a huge topic in itself. Uh, I'm sure we'll do plenty of state of .NETs in the future focusing just on that, uh, as well as desktop development. Desktop development is uh, getting a huge boost in .NET 6, whether that is conventional desktop development, quote unquote, like WPF and, and WinForms, but also the new MAUI stuff, Blazor stuff, uh, Windows App SDK. Uh, again, those are also things that we'll probably do a state.net about in the future because we've done a state.net focusing on desktop development this year already, which you can go back to and watch the recording of. Uh, and it's been one of our most uh, attended state.nets we ever had, somewhat to my surprise. So uh, cool that this stuff is, is prominent in .NET 6. So let's dive, uh, dive right in and let's uh, take a look at the overview, what this is all about. And like I said, the big vision is finally coming together. One .NET, which is what the code name of a lot of this was, which means we want to have one version of .NET that goes from the desktop all the way through to the cloud and everything in between, whether that's mobile, whether that's web, whether that's services, whether that's IoT, whether that's gaming, all of that is now on one platform. So no more worrying about do I target .NET standard, do I target uh, Xamarin, do I target Windows. It doesn't matter. At this point, .NET is one runtime, one standard, uh, and the fragmentation has come to an end. And that's really a problem we have because we used to have the full .NET framework or the classic framework as we call it today. Uh, that running on the classic CLR the way it was envisioned back in the late 90s. Uh, we've had the Mono runtime that became Xamarin. We had things like uh, the stuff that runs on Linux, the stuff that runs on Mac, Android, iOS, and so on. And all of those are now brought back together as one runtime, and everything.NET runs on that, and everything.NET has been re-engineered from the ground up to run on those things. Now, that's not to say that on top of that, there can't be things that target certain platforms. You could have things that only run on IoT devices. You could have APIs and SDKs that only make sense in the cloud. You can have things that only make sense on Windows and so on. Uh, but that sits on top of that basic platform and you'd be specifically targeting that at this point. So it's exciting. A lot of this was supposed to be in the .NET 5 timeframe. Due to the pandemic and various other reasons, that didn't happen. And so now we got it on uh, .NET 6. And it's almost all there. We'll have some exceptions of things that got delayed a little bit. We'll talk about that as well. But it's, uh, it's an exciting time. So when you look back at the history, uh, which now lasts well over two decades, you know, .NET had many twists and turns. When you look at what we had historically, you know, anything from the, from the full framework to even things like UWP and Silverlight and Windows Phone, structures quite changed uh, and targeting those things was quite different and, and so it's really exciting that we get away from that and, and are back in a, in a world that works better. So here's the timeline that we currently have for .NET and, and one of the things you'll notice 
that as of November two years ago, November 2019, things have become very predictable, which is important, especially for enterprises, but it's important really for everyone. So starting in November 2019, uh, 2019 we had the .NET Core 3.1 release. Uh, so that was a huge release that finally brought the .NET Core vision to fruition with everything that we really wanted to have in .NET Core where it became more of a major platform. Originally, .NET Core was envisioned as this new way of running ASP.NET. It was just called ASP.NET Core. It had some ideas around re-engineering the platform for cloud. It had some uh, ideas around scalability, around side-by-side -side running, about containerization, around uh, running multiple things on the same server and a server farm in the cloud and making that more efficient, basically re-envisioning .NET for the modern world and getting away from uh, what .NET was envisioned for maybe 20 plus years ago. Uh, so that was a major step. Then last year in November, .NET 5.0 became available. Note that we dropped the .NET Core label out of that. Uh, so back to it just being .NET. Uh, and that was the first step towards this one.net vision. And so that became available early November 2020 uh, with a general availability license. And now we're in November 2021 or almost. Uh, the release date is just around the corner uh, of .NET 6. And that's going to be a long-term support version. So there's a difference between general availability and long-term support. Uh, Long-term support uh, means Microsoft supports it a lot longer than the general availability versions. The GA versions are always replaced a year later with an LTS version. So that doesn't mean you can't use the .NET 5 version. It's still supported for a considerable amount of time, but it also means it should be very easy to upgrade from .NET 5 to .NET 6, and, and that's certainly true in this cycle. And uh, therefore, every other version will be longer uh, support than the prior one. But it's going to continue like this. So we expect in November 2022, we'll have a .NET 7. It's a GA version. In November 23, of .NET 8 will be a long-term release version and so on. Now, there might be minor releases in between. Just release this whatever feature packs, downloads. Uh, so that's not off the table. That's certainly happening uh, in an evergreen world. But the major release is always going to come out in November. So that's nice, very predictable, um, and certainly a departure from what he had in years past. If you can't wait uh, till the early November date, uh, just a few days away, but of course the .NET 6 release candidates are currently available, same for Visual Studio, but the official release date is November 9th. Uh, it's always around that November 9th date uh, every year now. Uh, and there's a specific event called .NET Conf. I'll have some more information uh, on that, uh, which is when that is always released. Now, what's different between .NET 5 and .NET 6? Well, like I said, .NET 5 was originally what was supposed to be that one .NET vision, but it just wasn't realistic to push that out in time. So it was a partial release in that sense, had a few things missing. Now, in the big picture, when you look at it, it actually had a lot. So if you are, say, a web developer, a Windows developer, a cloud developer, you'll, you have a lot of the features that are in .NET 6 you already have in .NET 5. But a lot more has been added in some areas. Also, under the hood, a lot has been changed. So a lot of performance improvements, for instance, or, and this is a very, very big feature, optimization and support for ARM platforms. Now you're going to say, why do I care about ARM platforms? I don't want to run on ARM. Well, maybe you do, because more and more devices are powered by ARM. Apple, for instance, has announced that their future MacBooks will be uh, based on essentially the same processor family that powers the iOS devices. And so that's also going to move to their quote unquote desktop computers. And we certainly want to make sure that .NET 6 can run on that and not just run on it in some capacity, but run on it very well. Uh, you may also see ARM in other devices. Microsoft has some devices that might be IoT devices and so on. So that's a hugely important development. I would even say that might be the biggest news from an infrastructure point of view since .NET Core 1.0 was released. Now in your day-to-day -day operations, you may not care so much but you certainly do care that the platform moves in the right direction, can support all these things uh, that are important. So very, very exciting news there. 
I want to mention a little bit this whole GA versus uh, LTS, general availability versus long-term support, because I keep hearing that. Uh, I've had customers that said, I'm not going to use .NET 5 because it's not a long-term support version. Well, that's not what this is meant to be. Uh, it's just that if you have a lot of software out there and you need to support it, you kind of got to have a structure plan as to how to do that. And so the GA version basically means you have a version that's supported for 15 months uh, with batches. Okay? Uh, so that means it's always supported an extra three months beyond the long-term support release. The long-term support release is always supported for three full years, so considerably longer. But what's important to understand is it's really easy to go from GA to LTS versions. So if you developed in .NET 5 and you want to move to .NET 6, it's really just a switch in the compiler config. There should be no code changes, there should be no structure changes. It's just next time you compile, you move to this new version and it should just work. So there really isn't any reason to not use a general availability version. I would highly recommend that. But I would also say when the new version comes around, move to that. So everything we did on .NET 5 uh, that we touch in any way, we'll certainly just flip that switch and say now compile it for .NET 6. So that's kind of how that works. And it's, it's no reason to not uh, adopt any of those, those versions. Um, now I said I was going to mention this, .NET Conf 2021. Uh, that's an online event, always has been online. Microsoft's done this for years now. It's always around that November 9th, uh, early November date. And it's been traditionally been the .NET launch event. So it'll be the .NET 6 launch event this year. You can sign up at .NET Conf .net. Uh, You'll get a lot more detail about what's going on uh, with .NET 6 and also Visual Studio. So Visual Studio releases in lockstep with .NET. Uh, the language C Sharp and, and also VB releases in lockstep with uh, a certain .NET version. And all of that happens at .NET Conf. So I encourage you to check out that launch event. We will also do a post-conference recap state of .NET next month, where we will dive a lot deeper into some of those areas that I can't talk about today because we're still pre-release and, and under NDA in some areas. Um, but uh, we will take a close look at that after the event as well. Uh, so that's going to be the Cliff Notes version. If you want to do the whole three days, uh, then uh, that's the event you want to go to. We are also, and this is a new announcement that I can make today. Uh, probably a lot of you saw this coming. We are also announcing that we're doing a Code Focus magazine on .NET 6. So this is a special issue of Code Magazine, and it's completely free. Uh, so it's free to current subscribers. If you're not a subscriber, here is a link that you can uh, get. It's while supplies last. So we are printing a certain uh, number of copies and everybody who signed up at that point will get that issue of the magazine free of charge. For those of you who come too late and have uh, no access to the print issue, this is of course also available on our website, all the content. This is available uh, as a PDF, it's available as HTML, it's available on Kindle, all that type of stuff. So even if you don't get the printed version, this is still free to you. And we are producing these issues together with Microsoft. So in a way, this becomes the definitive source about what's new in .NET 6 straight from the horse's mouth. The authors are generally people at Microsoft that actually worked on those features. So it's very, very cool. I'm not trying to sell you anything here because it's free, right? Uh, so tell your friends about this. Uh, this should be a, a pretty cool guide to .NET 6 that you can read cover to cover. Okay, So make sure you get that. Also, we did the same thing for .NET 5 a year ago. Same idea, free to everyone, developed in conjunction with Microsoft by Microsoft authors. And because .NET 5 and .NET 6 are two phases of the same vision, a lot of the content that we have in the .NET 5 issue, or all the content really, is still very, very applicable today. So in a way, it's almost like if you want to read them cover to cover, read both of them and it gives you everything that's in .NET 6. So very, very cool content, probably the most in-depth content uh, put out by anyone from Microsoft uh, that's concise and really meant to cover the whole area. So check that out, cool stuff. 
Now, what does it mean to have a unified platform? A unified platform really means just that. We have a .NET foundation at the bottom, uh, foundation in terms of foundational technology, not, not the organization, uh, and that runs everywhere. There's compilers, there's languages, there's the CLR components that go with that. All of that is now standardized across the board. And then on top of that, we run things like desktop apps in various ways. WPF, WinForms, fully supported and improved lately. UWP is still there, of course. Uh, we got the Samarin stuff. We got Blazor. We got things like Maui coming. I'll talk about that a little bit. All of that's there. We got the web, ASP.NET, Blazor client-side stuff uh, supported by backend. Uh, we got, of course, the cloud. That's a huge area. No need to talk about that. We've talked about the cloud a million times. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today talking about the cloud, but that doesn't mean it's not important. It's super important, and we have uh, Stata.nets recorded very recently that you can still get to. We got the mobile side of things. We got Samarin. Uh, we got Samarin that becomes more ubiquitous. Uh, that's We're probably not going to name it Xamarin as much as before because now it's called Maui in terms of uh, what Xamarin Forms has become. Uh, it runs on Android, it runs on iOS, it runs on Mac, it runs on Windows and those are the big news that we have a scenario where Microsoft's focusing on Mac and Windows as well as the true mobile platforms and that's a big part of why Microsoft made sure all of this stuff runs on ARM very well. Uh, we got the gaming uh, based on things like Unity, uh, that's a third party thing. Uh, if you're in this presentation today, you're probably not a game developer. If you are, welcome, but just so you know that's there as well. We got IoT, devices become more and more important, so we see that. And of course, we got AI. AI is becoming uh, available everywhere. It's not something where you either do AI or you don't do AI. AI just supports everything. It becomes part of your application. And so there's a lot of stuff there. And so all of that runs on top of that same platform. If you are doing IoT development, you're just building a .NET project, a .NET assembly. You're not specifically having to target a certain version of .NET anymore. You're not having to focus on, well, what can I reuse if it's .NET 5 or .NET 6? it will run so that's important and then of course we have the tools that go along with all of that starting at the bottom uh, with the command line interface the lowest level way of dealing with dotnet but also probably the most fundamental way of dealing with dotnet uh, and the new platform we got visual studio code super popular editor for code based editing it's not a WYSIWYG environment with designers not meant to be it's meant to be a really good code editor and it's very, very popular as that, and we use that a lot. We've got Visual Studio for the Mac, if you want to do that. Uh, so there's a new version of that as well. And we got the regular Visual Studio, the full-blown thing with all the bells and whistles, much, much more heavyweight application, Visual Studio code. Not as nimble, but super powerful. And it received some upgrades that I really, really like. So I've kind of returned a little bit more uh, to regular Visual Studio when I used Visual Studio Code in the past. So now, you know, more of an even spread again, I guess. The .NET ecosystem is huge. I always try to throw in a presentation about the momentum of the ecosystem. Uh, I think this slide is now about a half a year old. Uh, it's always difficult to get the most uh, current one. And, and the numbers maybe don't even mean that much or maybe are not that important. The main thing I'm trying to drive home with this slide is the .NET ecosystem has a lot of momentum. There's a ton of active developers that develop .NET every day. Uh, there's a ton of feedback that people give that show that people really like developing on .NET. So when you look at things like GitHub surveys or, or Stack Overflow surveys or all kinds of stuff, uh, .NET is always very well like does it always come out at the top no maybe not all the time but very often um, open source has become a huge thing there's a lot of momentum behind open source on the dotnet platform in the microsoft environment in general microsoft has become the biggest open source contributor basically c sharp is always in the top five languages on github uh, performance is great uh, new students are moving to dotnet so Bottom line, uh, you know, whether the exact numbers here are the most up to date or not, I believe they are the most accurate uh, that I could find. But the point is, 
there's a lot of momentum behind this and people love this platform. Uh, adoption is going up. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's happening in .NET today, like Blazor web development, is getting adopted faster than what we've seen in prior generations. So in, in other words, .NET adoption is accelerating, not slowing down. So that's nice as well. Okay, we already talked about ARM, ARM64 specifically. .NET targets ARM64, a lot about .NET 6 is 64-bit development. And Microsoft has decided to focus on the 64-bit stuff for ARM because all the new stuff is doing that. So making sure it runs well on ARM-based phones, making sure it runs on things like the Surface Pro X that, that it's ARM-based. But almost most importantly, uh, it's the Apple side of things uh, because Apple is moving away from Intel based chips to ARM chips. So being able to run on top of that transparently without you needing to know that you're running on ARM. That was one of the big problems in the past. Microsoft has been down this ARM route before and then it was like, oh, here is your device and can do this tiny subset of things and you have to target it specifically. Well, that wasn't very useful and didn't adopt very well. Uh, people didn't care about that very much. But being able to just develop a new .NET 6 app and it just works well on ARM, that is huge. And this is why I'm saying this might be the biggest fundamental release in .NET since the .NET Core 1.0. Uh, so again, if you, if you never have to worry about this again and it just works and your stuff runs everywhere, then, then this was achieved well. Uh, performance improvements have been great. Entity Framework, which has some major new features in .NET 6, is also much, much faster. 70% faster in a lot of cases. 31% uh, faster query performance, which is interesting because a lot of the query stuff happens on the back end, uh, but it's just been optimized highly. 43% uh, reduced memory allocation in a lot of cases. And by the way, a lot of this performance stuff that I'm showing you here Again, are the, are the exact numbers super important? Maybe not, but the point is it is greatly improved in performance and, and highly optimized. And read the Code Focus magazine. We have a great article in there about the, the platform overall. And a big part of that is looking at performance and the kinds of things that were improved and what Microsoft did to improve that. And it's, it's really quite amazing some of the things they did. So in, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here today. I mean, there's lots of stuff I could go in, like uh, chase and serialization, which has been greatly improved and stuff like that. But read that article. It's, it's actually really cool and interesting. Okay, so that's that. Now, diving into the features specifically, a lot of people say, well, okay, I don't have .NET 5. I don't even have .NET Core 3.1. I, I have an older code base. I have a, an older ASP.NET app based on .NET 4.x. I, I have a WinForms app based on .NET 3. I have a WPF app, uh, those types of things. The way to move that forward is by using the .NET Upgrade Assistant. The .NET Net Upgrade Assistant, which you have a link to here, uh, is a tool that currently is a command line tool. Probably in the future we'll get more of a UI for it that helps upgrade C Sharp and VB apps to this new world of .NET 5, I guess, but, but also .NET 6. Um, and what it does is it analyzes your code base and then guides you through a multi-step process of updating your code base. Uh, you can also use it to just analyze it to see what's the problems that are coming my way because not everything will just work. It will take a little bit of time if you have a really old code base. Uh, but what I was surprised about with this particular tool is how sophisticated it is and also that it's extensible. So providers of third-party frameworks, for instance, can tie into this tool, write extensions for it. There's an extension marketplace for this tool, which gives you an idea of how uh, serious Microsoft is about that. And so you can extend it and it really guides you through your specific development uh, conversion efforts. Um, so it's a multi-step process, fairly involved, shows you, hey, you have this... Uh, this application needs to be upgraded to the new project format. It needs to upgrade, upgrade NuGet packages. It needs to use different NuGet packages. It needs to change these code patterns and so on. So quite sophisticated, can do all kinds of things at this point from class library, console apps, uh, to ASP.NET MVC and Web API, even WinForms and WPF. And Microsoft is adding to that more and more, but it's already covering a huge range of things. And like I said, it's covering C-sharp and VB projects. So quite a bit of stuff going on there that's uh, used in the real world. So 
don't shrug this off as oh another stupid wizard type tool no this is a developer's command line tool that is really powerful and will really help you all right now let's talk a little bit about visual studio the big news is visual studio 2022 which has been available in preview for quite a while um, and it recently as the previews go along and as we've now reached release candidate status uh, has received a bunch of new features that uh, maybe most people didn't even expect so first of all visual studio 2022 for the first time is a native 64-bit application and what that means is it can take advantage of newer computers it can take advantage of more memory in particular uh, which means much more performance because it can keep more stuff in memory uh, it can optimize things a lot better especially on large projects it's faster in loading the project it's faster in the editor it's faster in features such as search uh, the ability to jump uh, to type definitions you know hitting control t and finding things in your project uh, is much much faster so that is very cool because frankly visual studio 2019 or, or other earlier versions got a little long in the tooth it, it was often very slow with the code bases I had to work on which are admittedly large and so I switched to Visual Studio Code just because it was so nimble but Visual Studio 2022 fixed a lot of that uh, it also has a, a slightly upgraded look in the sense that it has new and more modern icons and colors one of the things that I really didn't see coming until recently and that I've never talked in this data.net before is that now actually is improved support for theming and customization. So finally, we get a lot of the stuff that Visual Studio Code had for ages where you can truly customize the look and feel of Visual Studio. And again, there's a marketplace around that. So just popping into Visual Studio here real quick. Here is my Visual Studio. Now you may immediately notice that there's a few interesting things here. Uh, in my case here, I chose to arrange the tabs on the left side, and uh, this this is improved. You can still make it look like the old way, right? So if you're like, oh, I don't want my tabs on the left. Well, by default, it isn't. The default the tabs is still across at the top. Uh, but I like it on the left, uh, and I like to group my tabs by project, and Visual Studio color codes the tabs by project if you want. So if you have a solution with multiple projects, uh, all the files that are open that belong to a certain project can be color coded and grouped together. It's a small thing, but I found it really, really useful. The more interesting thing is that as you now go into your options dialog, you will see that there is more choice in the different themes that Visual Studio offers. Now, out of the box, it'll have one or two extra themes compared to earlier versions, but you can go into the marketplace and look for themes and you'll find a lot of new themes in there. So, for instance, I downloaded this Monokai theme and I can switch to that. And now you see that Visual Studio changes to adopt to that. And it's not just the Chrome, it's not just the window background, but you can finally modify the syntax coloring theme, for instance, which I really like. Uh, so this is a little bit of a wild one, Monokai. I sometimes switch to that, uh, but I chose it for this presentation you know, because it looks really different, right? The, the syntax coloring, as you can see, looks really different. So, so that's kind of cool. You can pick and choose what you want, and I find that very nice. And, and just Visual Studio before was kind of outdated because it didn't support all of that stuff. Okay, we have things like improved debugging and productivity. We'll look into some productivity features, but it's one of those things where you're like, oh yeah, it's more productive and isn't every version of Visual Studio more productive than the, the prior? So it's, it's, it's a nice to have, you feel, but now that I've used Visual Studio 2022 for quite a while, I can't imagine going back to an earlier version. It is so darn smart with a lot of the stuff that it does. It is just unbelievable. And, and a lot of that has to do with AI. Visual Studio 2022 is AI driven and therefore it just figures out what you specifically want to do. And sometimes you just look at it and you're like, wow, this is this is just unbelievable. So there's this new thing called AI IntelliCode and we'll take a look at that specifically. Um, there's some other new editor features that I really like. Uh, there's uh, what's called inheritance margins. What is that? That is this new little icon here in the margins that goes with the definition of a class. Like in this case, just happen to have a WinForms app up. Uh, and I can click this icon here 
And what this shows me is the inheritance that's going on. So I see uh, for this form one that inherits from a win form, what, what are all the other things that this inherits from? And so I can see that here, I can also see the implemented interfaces. So that's nice, right? That, that gives me some information that I didn't see before. Uh, that's quite nice. Another thing is these inline hints. Uh, so for instance, I already wired up a click event here, and this click event takes two parameters, right? If I do that again, if I just say click plus equals, um, and I could create either a handler for this that has an object and an event args parameter, or of course, I could just say I'm doing uh, an O comma E lambda expression like this, right? But then what, I, what is O and E? And you see that it popped in these hints here that tell me what these parameters, in this case, what type they are. Or, for instance, if I was to say var x equals uh, 1.5, right? it figures out what x needs to be. Uh, the var keyword does that. I don't have to specify it. But it gives me a hint here what I've created. I've really created a double. Now, it doesn't put that into source code. right? If you watch my cursor move here, I'm going to the right one and it just jumps over this whole thing. This is not really in the code file. It's just the editor displays that hint for me. Now, this is something that's off by default. Uh, to get that, you have to go into your editor setting, text editor, in my case, C Sharp, uh, and you go into advanced and you scroll down a little bit. And here are those inline hints and you can turn those on. Uh, I can also turn that back off. Uh, but what I like to do, because they can get a little distracting, I fine tune what I want to see it as, or I turn them off entirely, but I keep this uh, display hints on Alt F1 on. So when I do that, the hints disappear again, but when I hit Alt F1, they show back up. Right? And then when I let go of Alt F1, they're gone. So that is the version that I really like, is where I can pop this in as needed, because sometimes you're like, well, what's going on here? What is this thing I'm dealing with? Uh, but Alt F1 brings it in. So, so you can totally fine tune that, but it's a really, really cool feature that helps you figure stuff out. Okay. Uh, we have things like improved refactoring, more refactorings that are available. So you, know, you kind of expect that from Visual Studio, that each version has new refactorings added. But what's also cool is you can refactor from the Solution Explorer. So you can just right click on a file and say, remove unused references. Okay. So that is kind of cool, or unused using statements, I should say. Uh, so that's kind of nice. There's also a new feature to remove unused references, which what that does is it removes things that are coming from a package manager. So if you have NuGet references that you're not actually using, the system can analyze your project and remove those. Okay. Um, we have improved editor config file support. That's one of those things that most code editors support this editor config configuration file. And so we now really have that integrated well. And uh, it allows things like applying code styles, applying code styles after the fact, right? So not just while you type. Um, IntelliSense completions have been improved. So if you're doing stuff like date time formatting or regex, for instance, you'll find that this is very cool. And then, like I said, we have the IntelliCode suggestions based on um, AI. Debugger improvements, I'm not going to show you a sample of this, but just to mention this, uh, lots and lots of nice little things, like the way you manage breakpoints. And say you have a loop, and then this runs a million times, and you have a breakpoint in there. How can you skip this breakpoint or use it when you really want it? So stuff like that has been improved. Uh, little things, but really improve productivity. Uh, you can now do remote testing better. So those are all nice things that have been added to debug scenarios. Uh, Microsoft's also implementing and integrating with GitHub and Azure DevOps better. Uh, no surprise, Microsoft owns GitHub, Microsoft owns Azure DevOps, so a, a tighter integration is nice there, right? In the past, people were like, oh, yeah, Visual Studio's integration with all kinds of Git uh, servers is not that great. Well, now it's better, right? So now it's actually really cool. Uh, and that's both for the UI elements in Visual Studio as well as the experience directly inside the editor and uh, figuring out like history, for instance, stuff like that. And also management of repositories right out of Visual Studio has improved as well. Let's talk a little bit more about the AI in Visual Studio. 
There's two things that are just really, really cool. Uh, one is auto completions and one is auto refactorings. And a lot of the stuff is based on what people do in general. So when you use IntelliSense, for instance, it knows not just what are the methods and properties that are on an object, but it knows based on, based on how people use uh, different APIs and, and uh, packages and all kinds of stuff that's out there. So specific to that kind of level, it knows how people use that and therefore what is the most likely thing you would like to do or should do. But it's also learning what you do specifically. Now let me show you this in action actually, so, so you get a better idea. So let's say here in this click event, we want to uh, create some kind of string output and we do this using a string builder. So I'm gonna say var sb. Now look at this, it immediately says, hey, I think you wanna do a new string builder. Why? Because I guess a lot of people when they create a string builder call it sb. So the AI learned that when I say var sp, I'm likely to do a new string builder. Now, is that because people do it in general or because I do it? I don't know, but it just works for me, right? So I can hit tab and here's my new string builder. And this is a simple example, but as you use Visual Studio 2022, I guarantee you, you'll be blown away by how Visual Studio can know what you want to do. Because it's just sometimes you look at it and it's like, well, I haven't done this before. Why does it know? And and it just does, it's, it's really amazing. So then I can say sb dot, and uh, let's say I do an append, and I do hello world, and let's add a character return new line. And let's say I do this a lot, all right? And then at the end of all this, you're gonna do, let's say a debug dot uh, right line. And note that it actually has in, in the dropdown here, it has some things that have a star. Right, so if I just say debug dot, uh, it shows three different things with a star that it thinks I'm most likely to use. Again, it learned that from other people and it doesn't just say, oh, if there is an assert method, that's the one I'm gonna highlight. It knows specifically for this debug object, that's what people use a lot. Uh, but I just wanna do debug dot write sp and then it says, hey, most people use two string and so that's fine. Um, so now we've created that, right? So, so that's one of the things you could do in here. Now you may say, hey Marcus, why are you doing this? You're doing a pen and then you're doing a carriage return line feed. Uh, what you really should do is you should take this out and you should do an append line. And so now we can go through and do this here. And so I do it a few more times. And then eventually what's gonna happen, and it's a little bit unpredictable on when this is gonna happen exactly because it depends on when, uh, when the learning algorithm kicks in. But eventually as you do this and you click this icon out here, note that the bottom item in here is an IntelliCode suggestion. And it says, hey, you probably want to do this for the other seven instances of this as well. And so I can go ahead and I can do this and boom, here is all my uh, however many lines I created with that same pattern fixed up. And it's not because it was exactly identical, right? So I could have had different text in here. I could have had patterns and interpolated strings. And no, you know, just anything that does appends with a line feed basically. But the point is the AI was smart enough to observe what I'm doing and create a new refactoring on the fly based on my interaction pattern with this environment. So there was no refactoring before that knew to remove the character to turn line feeds and, and turn an append into an append line. But because I've done it a number of times, it knows it, it learns it, and it then allows me to apply that across the board. And so it's features like the auto completion and features like uh, the intelligent refactoring that'll just blow you away. I guarantee you if you're using this for a while, you'll be scratching your head at some of the things that it understands and knows. And this just makes advanced refactoring, a cleaning up code bases and so on, or even creating new code bases, drastically more productive. So I'm, I'm in love with this feature, if you can tell, and uh, I can't imagine not having this anymore. Another thing in Visual Studio 2022 that I just couldn't live without anymore is hot reload. 
This is basically edit and continue on steroids. So what this allows you to do is something like this. So I now wrote this and we can trigger this and this makes a WinForms app pretty simple. Just open the window here and I'm gonna clear my, my output window. And if I click this form, note that I'm echoing to the output window here. That's the code that we just wrote here, right? So I can clear all and, and I can do that. And so that's all nice and my form is up and running. But now let's say I don't want to do a debug.write, but let's say I want to echo that to a message box, for instance. So I could go in here and note that my code is running, right? My window is still up. And so I'm going to go message box dot and check this out. It knows that I likely want to do a show, but it also knows that it's probably string builder dot to string. How cool is that? So I just say tab and accept that. And, and here is our message box. Okay, so that's all nice and good. I'm saving this. My app is still up and running here, right, with all its state. And now I can click this hot reload button up here in the toolbar. So I'm clicking hot reload, and now I'm causing another click event on the form, and boom, there's my message box. How cool is that? My app is still running. It's like edit and continue on steroids, but it just works much, much better. So it allows you in many cases to just keep your app up and running and continue development. Uh, the web guys are going to be like, oh, well, we've done this in JavaScript for ages. Well, not, you know, with the compilation steps you now need, maybe not so much anymore. Uh, but this is just amazing to me that I can do this on a very sophisticated Windows app and it works in almost all cases. Now, logically speaking, you are going to reach a point where it doesn't work anymore, right? Like, let's say, I, I yanked out a lot of references and I changed this to be a WPF app rather than a WinForms app and, and now I'm expecting it to hot reload. Well, that's not going to work, right? And in fact, there's steps before that where it's not going to work. If you have drastic structure changes of your app, it won't work anymore. But in most practical cases, it just works. And what it does is it keeps the app in memory, but it yanks out the loaded assemblies and sticks in the new assemblies. So if you have a complex app that you're testing and developing and then iterating on and you had to like navigate into five layers of UI and load data and it took you three minutes every time you had to do that, it'll maintain that state in memory, right? You can edit and continue on that. So really, really cool feature that makes you highly productive. And there's two ways of doing this. I can save this and then I can hit that hot reload button but well, I'm gonna shut this down to show you. But that hot reload button also has the ability to say hot reload on file save. That would mean as soon as I hit Control S or the save button, it performs the hot reload on the fly for me. So if you prefer that kind of development, I usually hit the hot reload button because I want it to be predictable. But if you prefer that kind of development, you could certainly do that. So cool stuff. So. The intelligent code, the hot reload, just right there, I'm unwilling to go back in, uh, to an earlier version of Visual Studio, not to mention the performance improvements. Um, so other stuff as well, a new razor editor. If you're doing a lot of razor page editing, Blazor type stuff, for instance, or, or ASP.NET stuff, the razor editor is awesome. Uh, in the past, it was lacking. IntelliSense wasn't that great. Refactorings weren't that great. Syntax highlighting wasn't that great. Integrations that you would normally expect, like go to definition, weren't that great. All of that is now there in the Razor Editor. So, so that's very cool. Now, with all that said, Visual Studio Code still remains a very cool environment to edit code. So I still use that a lot. Uh, in .NET 5, it works with a lot of things, including, say, WinForms app, although you don't get the designer. Right? But if you like code editing, this is very cool. Now, the big news around Visual Studio Code, which if you don't know that, Visual Studio Code is actually a, an Electron-based thing. right? It's, it's basically an HTML-based web app as an editor that runs in a window shell. Okay? Uh, now, in the new world, that still exists. That's still the main way of using Visual Studio Code. But there now is a secondary version of Visual Studio Code which actually runs in the browser. And I can go there, you can do that at home. You can go to vscode.dev. And when you do that, it just loads up Visual Studio Code. You don't have to have it installed or anything. It is just Visual Studio Code in the browser. And you can come in here and you can say, I want to open a folder. Let's pick that same WinForms folder that I had and you gotta give it access to that. 
And boom, here is your, your WinForms app, and you can go into that and, you know, see all kinds of code stuff that's in there, and you can edit it in here. You can even install extensions, all kinds of stuff, right? So it's an amazingly feature complete version of Visual Studio Code in, in the browser. So if you just need a quick editor on any environment that has, that's not set up as a dev environment, this is great. Another scenario where this is great is when you go into GitHub. So that's how we say we go into our code framework folder, which is uh, one of our GitHub repositories. And let's say we pick code framework for WPF. So you see GitHub in here. Now what you can do is you can hit the period key, right? So just the dot key. I'm going to hit that right now. And what it does is it's going to load Visual Studio code from within GitHub and it's going to load your repository, right? And you can now directly edit that GitHub repository right there because GitHub now has integrated Visual Studio Code in an, as an editor. I mean, how cool is that if you just want to make a quick change to your repository? Or it may even be more sophisticated changes because it is full Visual Studio Code, including extensions and all kinds of stuff. So I think that's just super cool and an announcement, especially the GitHub integration that I wouldn't have necessarily expected. Okay. So that's about all I want to say about Visual Studio Code. Again, this is a topic that's super exciting. I could probably spend the whole Stata.net just on that. We don't have that time, but make sure you check that out as well. Now let's talk a little more about the platform. Uh, what are the main features on the platform uh, of .NET 6? And there's some themes here. A lot of the themes in .NET 6 revolve around this idea of simplifications and making you more productive. And that starts with the language, C Sharp 10. That's the main theme of C Sharp 10. But also for things like Web API, uh, creating APIs or services, REST services with less code is a main, main theme there. And we'll take a look at that. We have the new MAUI stuff, the Microsoft Multi-Platform API. Formerly, Xamarin Forms is growing from just a mobile thing to this is how you can build your UIs everywhere. Uh, we have Blazor, which has been there in .NET 5 and even before, but .NET 5 it matured and became popular, uh, which can now also be used better to create desktop apps if you want to approach it from that angle. So Maui is kind of the rich platform angle going everywhere. Blazor Desktop is taking HTML-based web development and integrating more into the desktop. So depending on where you started out, you want to choose one or the other. Uh, we have more device targets. We have uh, WinForms and WPF, uh, single EXE deployed on ARM64 environments. Uh, we have the developer productivity theme that we already thought. We have the performance improvements that we already talked about. So uh, lots of stuff going on there. Let's talk a little more specifically about C Sharp 10 and also kind of a little bit about C Sharp 9. As I said, these language versions go in lockstep with the version of .NET. So C Sharp 9 is .NET 5, C Sharp 10 is .NET 6. Um, now here are some cool things. .NET, uh, this was already introduced in C Sharp 9. Top level statements, making simple apps simpler to create. In a world where we create more and more stuff out of micro apps, microservices, and then compose our apps out of that, you want those apps to be as simple as possible. Okay. So what we have here is an older style console app in C Sharp that required all the stuff around here to do using system. You create a namespace and you created a, a class and you created a main entry point. And the only line of code you were really interested in was console.write line. Okay. Well, that's a lot of code to write for that. In C Sharp 9, you could instead do this. You could do a using system and then it just did a console.write line. And this is almost identical to the example on the left. The only thing we're not doing in here is a namespace declaration. But the, in general, the code that will be output from this is going to be the same in both cases. It's just the namespace is going to be auto-generated. But if you looked at the IL, you'd essentially see the same code. And there were interesting features like record types. Record types are a good way to handle things that are immutable. Now, very important in today's asynchronous environments. We talked about that in prior Stata.net. So go check out the recording for Stata.net 5 or, or look at the focus issue for that. But just so you know that that's there. We had things like init only setters, things that you can set 
only while that type is initializing, which was important for record types. We had our enhanced pattern matching. All of that was really in prep for future features as well. Uh, simplified object instantiation, um, Lambda, and, and so on, right? So we've already talked about that before. Now what's new in C Sharp 10? We have things like required initializer. So if you wanna set up a field that you say, this has to be initialized. Um, being able to more directly control what the backing field of an automatic property is. Often if you wanted to create a, a property but wanted to do some stuff with the backing field, you had to go and, and all of a sudden expand the auto property into a lot more uh, code just for making a simple change, right? Like accessing, say, say it had an auto property, but you wanted to do a two upper on the getter, uh, on a string property, for instance. That would turn your very, very concise statement into probably 10 lines of code just because you had to manually define uh, the backing field, and that's now gone. Um, we have a very cool feature called global using statements. There are certain things in your setup, in your project, that you probably always want. Using system is almost always there. If you're building a WinForms app, using system.windows.forms is almost always there. Uh, so why can't you set that up for the project on a global basis? Well, you now can using global using directives and then each line, each uh, code file is much shorter. Uh, namespace declarations in C-sharp have traditionally been done with an open close curly bracket, which then indented everything and has made the code more complex in that sense. Uh, and most of the time, you would only really need that if you have two namespaces in a single code file, which is you know probably not the best thing style-wise anyway. And I've never in the wild seen a C-sharp code file that declared more than one namespace, or almost never, I should say. Uh, so now what you can do is you can just declare the namespace in a single line at the top, semicolon at the end, and then the rest of the file goes into that namespace without needing open, close, curly brackets. Small features, but, but kind of really nice to have. So if you look at that example that I had before with our C-sharp 9 version, what you can do in C-sharp 10 is you can use that using system line and stick it into some global place in the app. Most of my uh, C Sharp 10 projects now have a, a global usings.cs file where I put all that stuff. So then I never have to worry about using system anymore. Um, and then the file actually only has two lines of code. It has the console.write line, but I can also do the namespace now in a single line, just namespace hello world semicolon. So down to two lines of code that express everything I wanted to do on the left side. Okay? So that's nice and very useful in a lot of cases. Now what this leads us to is this feature that I find incredibly useful, which is minimal APIs. If you're doing API development on the web, you often have this scenario where you have to stand up a whole ASP.NET Core app with all kinds of infrastructure and uh, just to do relatively simple APIs, right? You just wanna re respond to a few requests. So here we have an example that's a four-liner, that's a full ASP.NET API. It basically uses the API builder. You could put that in a global using statement, I suppose. Uh, you then create a web application, and then you map patterns. In this case, it's the root of my domain to do something. And in this case, it just returns a string. More likely, it will probably return a JSON result but in this case, it just returns a string. And then I run in, and so if I run this, and somebody just goes to my, the root of my web app, they'll get back this hello world string. It becomes a four-liner or a three-liner if you have a global using statement somewhere. Okay. And what you can then do is you can do fairly advanced services. Like this is an example of a weather service that's actually being used, where we just map a get to slash weather slash location. It enables cores it then runs a method that happens when somebody hits, say, slash weather slash Houston. It then performs async calls using this task that was generated up here where we go to a certain URL and it passes in the location and it finds three different things, the weather, the hourly forecast, and the daily forecast, waits for all of them, and just returns a new object that has these results on it, which will then result in a JSON result set being sent back. And so all of a sudden, this relatively sophisticated service that can do a weather forecast and a current weather report 
becomes this single file with 10, 15 lines of code. Uh, so that's taking C Sharp and ASP.NET much closer to what you'd find in some other environments that were more optimized for these simple scenarios. So very, very cool, cool productivity stuff. Another thing that we are now doing that uh, just wanted to mention is single file applications. Uh, it's especially cool if you just want to do X copy deployment. And this works across all application types. If you're building a web app or a Windows app, you can actually compile it down into a single EXE that has everything in it that that application needs. It does assembly trimming, meaning it only includes what you really need out of your reference assembly. So it takes the reference, the, the, the assemblies you included in your app, grabs the parts that it needs out of it, sticks it into your single EXE, and then you can deploy that in a very efficient fashion. There's some tree shaking for that, which means you have to be careful with things like reflection, but there's ways to deal with that as well. Now I want to mention real quick Windows development. Uh, again, we've had Stata.net's about that in the past, but Windows development is a first class citizen in .NET 6. So you can do WinForms development, you can do uh, WPF development, UWP, the new MAUI stuff that we'll talk about. Uh, there's improved support for click once deployment and, and you know other deployment mechanisms. So just so you know, we'll probably talk about that again in the future, but that's certainly there. And, and if you're doing WinForms or WPF development, I highly recommend that you take your code base forward because you're otherwise on a dead end platform and it's very easy to move this stuff forward, right? So in many cases, you don't have to do a lot of work to make that happen, especially with the upgrade tool. So if you have any questions around that, feel free to, to send me or Jim an email and we'd be happy to help you with that. This is uh, some, a unique thing that we do more than other people probably. So uh, we can definitely help you with that. There's the new Windows app SDK, formerly Project Reunion. Just like .NET is getting unified back into one .NET, the Windows app SDK and all these different ways of building Windows apps from UWP to, to the fluid WinUI stuff that the Windows guys are doing to this, what Xamarin is doing to, to what the .NET team is doing with WinForms and WPF. All of that is now available everywhere as the Windows app SDK. So it's not that you're a WinForms developer and therefore you can't take advantage of the things that were available in the Microsoft Store apps. Right? You can now use those UI components in your apps. It's just more classes that are available. Uh, plus, side note, with Windows 11, the new store, you can deploy all kinds of apps into the store now, not just the UWP apps that didn't catch on that much, to be honest. Right? So, so it's cool because you now got everything everywhere and you can deploy it well. So that's there. Um, another side note, WebView 2, the web browser control based on the new Edge Chromium engine is now available, has been available for a while. And if you're doing anything in your apps, Windows, WPF, anything like that, that shows HTML using a web browser control, you should upgrade to this because it's an evergreen control. It supports the latest standards. It's more lightweight than and less restrictive than embedding a Chromium control, for instance, if you've done that, which then forces you to compile your app in a certain way and all kinds of stuff. This just works. I uh, highly recommend that we are using that a lot. Uh, WinUI 3 is something that if you're a Windows developer, you should probably check out. Uh, it's an, a set of classes that's not coming from the .NET team, but it's coming from the Windows team. Okay, so this is what powers a lot of the stuff that's uh, core windows now, you know, the weather app and stuff like that. Uh, and so these classes, these libraries are available as .NET components and really are the most modern way of building a Windows UI. So you should probably use those in your application. It's part of the Win app SDK. All right, now switching gears a little bit and let's talk about a big thing in .NET 6, and that is MAUI, the Microsoft Multi-Platform Application UI. So it doesn't stand for the island, which I think is a bummer since I live on MAUI, uh, but it's about an application user interface that works cross-platform. So what this really is, is an evolution of Xamarin Forms. 
If you're familiar with the Xamarin mobile development, you know that Xamarin Forms can target different platforms. It can target Android and iOS. Those are the two main things that it focused on, but it could also always target other things. It could target UWP, it could target Mac. It was just not really pushed in the past and it kind of fell by the wayside a little bit. Earlier versions of Xamarin actually have more templates than the newer versions you know, or made them more visible at the very least. Uh, so now with .NET 6 in general, with the .NET 6 timeframe, Microsoft has been completely revamping Xamarin Forms, rebranding it as MAUI, and it's a huge effort, right? It's, it's taking that code base that Xamarin had and kind of re-engineering it from the ground up. That's the good news. The bad news is they didn't quite get it done yet because it's a huge thing. So MAUI is delayed a little bit into 2022. Probably second quarter is, uh, I think, what was announced, uh, but watch out for announcements there. Uh, I think it's not written in stone at this point. So not quite there yet, but a preview version is available. Uh, and what it does is it just takes this cross-platform development to the next level and enabling you in a much more prominent fashion to not just target the mobile platform, but also Mac OS and Windows. So for a lot of people, especially people that are already used to Xamarin development, also people <clears throat> that are already used to Windows development like WPF and WinForms, this might be a really good way to build their desktop apps in the future. We have to see how much this catches on and, and what it's like when it's done, but it looks very promising at the very least. So coming in from a rich platform, rich client angle, creating a platform that allows you to develop UIs for all these things in a very native way. So it's not HTML running on different platforms, it's actually running the iOS controls, the Mac controls, and so on. Uh, so cool stuff. I'm sure we'll do a stata.net about this. There's an article about this in the focus issue, so check that out. Unfortunately, still not quite ready yet for me to dive into a lot more detail there. Okay. Here is another uh, slide that shows you a little more about this. and. Uh, the GitHub link where you can join that. Let's talk a little bit about web development. Web development, obviously, is very important in .NET 6. Um, and it goes across the board, not surprisingly, right? So we have different web UI things. Uh, you can still do MVC style development. A lot of people do, we do uh, use that quite a bit. You can use the Razor pages, very prominent thing. You can build single page apps that run on a client, but are backed by ASP.NET and .NET in general, and there's better support for that, and it's a little better integrated, uh, kind of taking a different approach. In the past, it was more, oh, here's our ASP.NET template for whatever, Angular or, or React or something like that. Now it's more like, now let's use the React stuff and just try to integrate with that better. And then, of course, we have Blazor. Uh, Blazor is a very, very popular technology. Again, the Blazor state of .NETs we've done in the past, you can go back and look at that. Uh, the the most attended stata.nets we ever had around uh, are around Blazor. So this gives you an idea of how popular this is. Now, fastest adopted Microsoft technology of all times. And what is Blazor? Blazor allows you to write .NET code and deploy it into the browser using browser standards, right? There's this uh, um, WebAssembly standard that's used for that. Uh, so it's a, it's a total standard thing. It's not a Microsoft specific thing, but it allows you to run C sharp code in the browser. Um, it's also a server-side component to this where you could do the same thing on the server. And it's a really cool framework around application development. So the way you create the UIs, the way you put components together, the way they're isolated from each other. Um, now I don't have a lot of time today to go into that in detail, but check out some of the state.nets we did on that. That's pretty cool. Then of course there's the services layer, HTTP APIs, uh, is one of the things that you probably do more than anything else. There's the Signal R stuff that allows you to do outbound communications from the service layer. There's gRPC for binary standards. If you uh, don't want to use REST JSON, you could use gRPC to be more binary optimized. So all of that sits on top of a shared middleware layer, shared server layer, same philosophy that everything else in .NET 6 has, right? So that's that. So what are the main themes around ASP.NET in this release? Again, it's reduction of code base, things like the minimum APIs that we've seen, developer productivity, performance improvements, especially around compilation, but also runtime. 
hot reload support for all kinds of things that you're doing in C-sharp, which for web guys is really important because on the web, when you're an HTML developer, you expect to just be able to have your app up and running and type and, and save and it shows up. And that is now also really well supported, better than in the past for C-sharp code development. Okay? So those are some of the themes that we see there. We talked about Blazor. Uh, again, check out the older recordings. The main thing I want to say here, the new development around Blazor, which Blazor was released a while ago and then really became mature with .NET 5. The major news around Blazor and .NET 6 is Blazor Desktop. If you in the past built the Blazor app, it would run in the browser. Now you could take that and you could say, create a PWA out of it, a, pro a progressive web app that I could install locally. And then the browser would go away, you get an icon, you start it, it pops up as its own window, no browser Chrome around it, just that app. But at the end of the day, it's still a web app. It can do what a web app can do. If you wanted to get a little more, more access to the local platform, then you needed to go to something uh, like Electron or the open source project that we are supporting, uh, Fotino, which is a WebView 2 based version of what Electron does. And if you're not familiar with either, it's a way to compile HTML apps into desktop apps and get better access to local resources on a machine than you would get with the progressive web app. But the downside of that is it only runs on desktop environments. You can run it on the Mac and Linux and Windows, but you can't run it on iOS and you can't run it on Android. Desktop Blazor takes that yet another step further and uses the MAUI infrastructure that can li literally run everywhere and sticks the Blazor programming model into that. Now, why would you use that over just doing a MAUI app? Well, you would use that if you're coming from a web angle. If HTML-based development is your thing, then that's a great way to go and target all these platforms. If you're coming more from a mobile or a desktop angle, then maybe MAUI is the best of those worlds, right? So you have the choice and you can combine those. So if bits and pieces are HTML, but you generally want to do MAUI, it's also a great way to go, right? So that's the biggest news uh, in Blazor. And as more slides, you can download these slide decks after this presentation, by the way. So I have a few slides in here that just document some of this stuff, but um, we've talked about this in the past. So I'm gonna skip over this. Okay, we talked about that. And that pretty much brings me to the end of this presentation. There is a lot more to .NET 6, but I have a limited amount of time, but hopefully this gave you a good overview of the things that are available in .NET 6. We will do another state of .NET a month from now that does a recap of the .NET Conf announcement. So things that I can't talk about today, diving into a lot more detail. In a way, it's part two of today's presentation. So if you're sitting there thinking, wow, why didn't he go into more detail about Maui? Why didn't he go into more detail about Blazor or this, that, or the other? Well, we probably will in part two of this presentation next month. So I hope to see you guys all there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Feel free to send me an email. Feel free to send Jim an email. Uh, I promise that I will answer. Uh, I will also say that I'm perpetually behind on my email. So if you need a quick answer, better to send it to Jim than to me. Um, and again, apologies for recording this today. Unfortunately, I had a scheduling conflict where I couldn't do it live. Hopefully, I'll be able to log on and at least answer your questions in chat. But I have my guys uh, hang out in the chat while this airs live so they'll be able to answer your questions in the chat uh, but as always consider us a resource feel free to send us an email we're not going to send you a bill for a 10 minute email answer uh, so just feel free to fire your questions our way and take advantage of our one hour of consulting offer uh, that takes this further right if you wonder how does this apply to my specific problem be happy to sit down with you for an hour and give you those answers. And other than that, thank you very much. I'm gonna hand it back to Jim and see you next month. Thanks, Marcus. I'll remind you that we're very interested in your feedback about this webinar and would appreciate you taking a moment or two to complete our survey. It's all of 12 questions, so you'll fly right through it. And one lucky attendee will receive a $100 Amazon e-card. Mark your calendar for Wednesday, November 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern for our next State.net webinar where Marcus Egger will recap the announcements and notable items presented at .NET Conf. 
Just a reminder that as a benefit for registering for this webinar, all registered attendees who don't already subscribe will automatically receive a free Digital Code Magazine subscription. Please share the subscription link with others who couldn't make it to the webinar. Code Consulting is hiring React developers. Come join the Code Consulting team. We have multiple junior and senior level React positions open, remote and on-site, full-time and contractor positions are available. Follow the link for more information. Through our free hour of code offer, you can ask for our help on whatever you or your team needs. No strings, no commitment, no credit card required, just help from our code experts. Reach out to me about scheduling your free hour of code. The Code Mobile app is available for both iOS and Android. It's the ideal way to read Code Magazine on the go. A free Code Magazine subscription is also available as a Microsoft benefit. Visual Studio subscription customers and Dev Essentials members qualify for a free Code Magazine subscription. That's it for today's presentation. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. If you're attending live, we will be in the chat window for a while answering as many questions as possible. If you're watching the post-event recording, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or through any of our communication channels. Thanks for attending, everyone. Have a great rest of the day or night, wherever you are.